thank you very much for the kind invitation. So this is my first uh, interaction with this group, and uh, it's, I'm glad to hear Dr. Chapman talk about the difficulties of people understanding the alpha-1 in the lung. I'll tell you it's worse in the liver. Um, I'm one of those people that lectures about alpha-1, and I teach about alpha-1, and then I teach fellows, not just GI specialists, but actually liver specialists. And then a year later, I know that if I ask them again, they'll have forgotten all of it. So uh, it's, but for you guys, you need to know that, you know it's a lung disease, but it's also a liver disease. Here are my disclosures. And Ken, I actually have no, cons I don't consult for any of the drug companies. I only do studies. So uh, that's probably the reason why he's in a jacket and tie and I'm not. All right, so I'm gonna to talk to you about three broad things. What does alpha-1 do to the liver? What is cirrhosis? And what can we do about alpha-1 in the liver? And that's probably the biggest question that people have, and I'll tell you, uh, I'll start off with a case that kind of illustrates all of this. So this guy I recently saw, he is older, he's 72, he's retired, he and his wife are enjoying their lives, and they were actually in Florida when he came down with pneumonia. He got very sick, came back to southern Ontario, and ended up in hospital for more than two months in ICU. And it wasn't the pneumonia that was the problem. They actually diagnosed him with cirrhosis, and he had never been diagnosed with cirrhosis before. And his cirrhosis manifested as he was completely swollen and fluid overloaded. He had confusion. Then when you're confused, it's very hard to breathe. So they couldn't get him off the ventilator. And they were just blown away, because if you look on the websites, I, I just looked at the Canadian website, but I looked at the American recommendations, and in general they say that once you're diagnosed with cirrhosis, you probably only have two years to live. And the reason why I got to know him is because one of my former trainees said, look, we diagnosed him with alpha-1. Huh? Sorry, I can't see my slides from here. Um, so they diagnosed him with alpha-1, and is there any point in sending him to Toronto? The people of the country, they hate coming to the big city. Is it even worth it? Because you can't do anything about it anyway. I said, absolutely send him, please. So he had been told that he was going to die, and we said, let's take a look at him, see if we can do anything. Okay, so what do we know about alpha-1? And the problem with alpha-1 in the liver disease specifically is that different people have a different view or lens of what alpha-1 in the liver is. If you talk to the pediatricians, they look at alpha-1 completely differently from someone like me who only deals with adults. So for the pediatricians, they know that most kids with alpha-1 have no signs or symptoms. And there was a movement and the question was asked, should we screen for alpha-1 in all babies? And I think the thought still is that it may not be worth it because most people don't need anything done. But for the liver disease specifically, we know that about um, one in nine people with alpha-1, specifically now is the ZZ that we're talking about, they actually have symptoms when they're born. And it usually manifests as prolonged jaundice. So you know that kids can be yellow for a long time. They put them under the UV lamp and things are fine. But these kids tend to have jaundice for say a month, two months going on, and their liver tests tend to be abnormal. They might have a big liver, big spleen. Fortunately, it all seems to go away completely by the time of six months. And we don't, you know, we have no idea why this happens. And when I talk to you about later on about what alpha-1 does to the liver, this blows my mind that it actually happens at all, that you have any symptoms that your liver is big. And not only that, but a few of these kids don't get better at six months. They go on to rapid cirrhosis, liver failure, and they end up getting a liver transplant. Okay. So how bad is this lack of knowledge? When I was getting ready for this talk, I was doing what everyone does. I Googled, and I found the first site was the Canadian Liver Foundation. And I know from talking to our pediatricians that if you have a baby with severe neonatal hepatitis, the first thing you should think about is alpha-1 antitrypsin. Okay? And nowhere in the Canadian Liver Foundation site on neonatal hepatitis did they ever mention alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So I actually emailed them and said, you need to talk to specialists, okay? Um, so, but the main thing is by the time they hit out of the, the pediatric circle, behind age 18, to the adult circle, the people that have survived the liver failure, so very few get liver failure, but the ones who had the prolonged jaundice, they're completely normal. Their liver enzymes are normal. 
they feel fine, okay? And there seems to be no liver disease between age 18 to age 40 unless you do something unusual. So for Ken, I actually do have a patient who is a firefighter. Okay, um, so what about adults? Most people have completely normal blood tests. And it is said out there in the, in the, in the Alpha-1 circle that when you have cirrhosis, that's when you have symptoms. And when you have symptoms, then chances are you're not going to live beyond two years. So looking at big series, it seems that very few people have any disease in the liver between age 20 and 50. But once you go over age 50 and the older you get, the more likely you are to have cirrhosis. And also, obviously, the older you are, the more things, other things that can damage your liver start to happen. People, people start drinking more, for example. And the other thing that people don't mention a lot about is liver cancer. Liver cancer certainly can complicate anyone with cirrhosis. And specifically in alpha-1, the risk of can liver cancer seems to be higher than, say, for example, hepatitis C. And we talk about liver cancer and hepatitis C all the time. So, what are the recommendations? The recommendations is that we do some sort of annual monitoring, that there is a physical examination for liver disease. I should give in my editorial right now that there, there's nothing on physical exam that you would see for cirrhosis. Um, that you should do an ultrasound once a year, and I should also give an editorial there that ultrasound does not detect cirrhosis until it's too late. And that you do blood tests, but I just finished telling you that liver enzymes are normal, so these blood tests will actually not be helpful to you. It was interesting that even in the American guidelines, there was a minority opinion that actually acknowledged that it's unusual to have disease between age 20 and 40, and so maybe you shouldn't subject everyone to all these annual tests until they hit the age of 40, which to me sounds reasonable. The question is, what annual tests should you be doing if you actually want to look for liver disease? So, what is cirrhosis? Because I just told you that your literature says that once you have cirrhosis, you will be dead in two years which, by the way, is completely incorrect. Okay, liver 101. This is your course on liver disease. Where is the liver? Who knows? Right side underneath your ribs. Usually you can't feel it unless the liver is big, then it comes below the ribs, and then it can become painful. So there is a picture. Imagine if you're lying, uh, looking in the mirror. It's on your right side underneath your ribs. What is the main function of the liver? Is it a filter? This is my pet peeve. It actually says in your literature, it's a fact, it's a filter. It is not a filter, okay? If it was a filter, there would be a, some blood test that says the liver filtration rate. The only medical blood test for a filtration rate is for your kidneys, not your liver. Your filter is your kidney, not your liver. So it's not a filter. So what does your liver do? Anyone know? It, you're all gun shy now. So the liver is taught as part of the, 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 the specialists that deal with the liver are your GI specialists. It's part of your digestive tract. So the GI specialists only focus on the first part of eating, which is the reason why you eat is to get nutrients. And the GI tract that they focus on is when you break down food and absorb it because you want to absorb nutrients. What do you do with all these nutrients? And the answer is you give it to your liver, okay? Because your liver will take the raw materials and build everything that you need. It is your factory. It will build, okay? So that is what liver function is. It is not a fil filter. It is a builder. So that completely determines what happens when you have liver failure and liver cirrhosis. So this is a, a, a picture that now takes away all the niceties and shows you the bare bones of your blood vessels. So that's, everything there is your GI tract. When you eat, food goes down into your stomach, it breaks it down to small little bits, then your intestines start throwing enzymes at it, breaking it down even more, and then you absorb it, and all the good stuff you start absorbing and see all the blue leads to your liver. Okay? And your liver is getting showered with all this good stuff, but by necessity, some bad stuff must come with it. So it's got to sort. It's not a filter. It actually actively sorts and says, this is good, take it in. This is bad, get rid of it. This is an infection from your gut, get rid of it. So it's got some immune surveillance, but it's no filter. It takes all this stuff in, builds fats, builds carbohydrates, builds proteins, it builds for you. And what's not shown here is that 
within an inch or two inches above the liver is actually your heart. Your heart takes all the good nutrients and sends it around to the rest of your body. So you take raw materials in to the liver, liver sends out good stuff to your heart. Okay? So that is what is cirrhosis. So what can go wrong if your liver has cirrhosis uh, and it stops working very well? Well, let me start off with this is not cirrhosis. This is what you guys, or what non-liver specialists think of cirrhosis, but this is not cirrhosis. So it is not, when someone has cirrhosis, we don't say you're going to die imminently because cirrhosis has no symptoms. It has no physical signs. So if your doctor is examining you, even if you had cirrhosis, they would not be able to tell. Okay? It's, uh, it is not irreversible. Some people think that once you have cirrhosis, it's a one-way street towards the end. And we've known since about 19, 2000 that if you can treat the underlying disease, cirrhosis can actually get better. It causes no significant symptoms. It is not detectable by those standard tests I showed you. The standard tests that your family doctors would call liver function tests are actually not liver function tests. They're called liver enzymes, another pet peeve. Um, but they actually tell you nothing about whether someone has cirrhosis or not. And also, it is not detectable by ultrasound until it is way too late. So this person who is dying of liver disease may have cirrhosis, but we actually call this liver failure. Okay? Cirrhosis leads to liver failure. It, it generally takes 10 to 15 years. So you have 10 to 15 years of no symptoms where you could actually treat them, but if you don't treat them, they get to this stage, and then they're going to die in two years or less. So we have to do a better job of finding it. So what exactly is cirrhosis? So when you have something that damages the liver, and usually it takes a lot of damage over a, lot, a long, long time, because the liver is one of those funny organs that's like a starfish. You cut off one part, it just grows back. Okay. You have to damage the liver so much that it stops growing back, such that you have the following problems. So the liver, remember I told you all the blood has to go to the liver. When you have bad cirrhosis, blood has a tough time getting through the liver, okay? and the blood will start to back up. And that actually makes a useful test for cirrhosis. Okay? If the bl blood is backing up into your gut, it also backs up into an organ called the spleen. So the spleen lives on the other side, so if your liver is on the right side underneath your ribs, spleen's on the left side underneath your ribs. And when blood backs up into the spleen, a funny thing starts to happen. One of your blood cell counts, called your platelet count, which is in a very common test called the CBC or complete blood count, it starts to go down, okay? The problem is when you have a low platelet count, that part of medical school is taught by the hematologists. And what the hematologists know is the platelet counts are responsible for your ability to clot. And if your platelets are under 20 or 30, if you, you might get bleeding gums, bleeding nose, so it becomes very significant and you have to treat it. But if your platelet counts are like 50 or 60, yeah, it's low, but you don't need to treat it because you have no symptoms. So it's top of the hematologist, and if your platelets are low, you know, 140, 150, 100, 50, it's not a big deal. But what the hematologists don't know is that the commonest cause of a low platelet count is actually cirrhosis because it's held up in the spleen. And once your platelet count is under 150, there's probably a two-thirds chance you have cirrhosis. Yes, other diseases cause a low platelet count, but two in three people with a low platelet count actually have cirrhosis with no symptoms, but the hematologists have taught all the doctors that this is not a number you need to worry about. 140, 130, 100, because you don't bleed until you're about 20 or under. Okay, so most doctors will ignore the falling platelet count, which is the first sign of cirrhosis. Um, so cirrhosis impairs blood flow, which affects the platelet count. Practically speaking, if you have cirrhosis, because the blood is having a tough time going through the liver, it will back up to other places. And the most important part is your esophagus, which is your food pipe connecting your mouth to your stomach. The veins are on the surface of your esophagus, so it's the only part of your body where veins are sort of exposed to sort of like air as opposed to being surrounded by tissues. And veins are like little balloons. When, when the pressure goes up, these balloons start to build up to get bigger and bigger. And as with any balloon, if you take a big balloon and you suddenly increase the pressure, your balloon will pop, it'll burst. 
And if that happens, it's not painful, but people can bleed on the inside. So that's what we call a soft varicel bleeding. The stomach fills up with water, or sorry, with blood. They feel nauseated. So if you're someone who's nauseated and you throw up, you're going to see blood everywhere. If you don't throw up, the blood will go through the body. It'll get digested. It'll come out the other end looking like road tar, black, very, very sticky, extremely smelly. So not something that's subtle, that's so smelly everyone in the room or in the house will know that something is up. Okay? So we tell all of our cirrhotics, if you ever have any of these two events, you throw up blood or your stools are jet black and tarry and stinky, you go straight to the emergency. You do not drive because the bleeding can be so fast you can pass out. So you call 911 or you get a friend to take you, but if you get a friend to take you, warn them that they, you may be throwing up in their car. <laughs> okay. So variceal bleeding is a, is a risk of cirrhosis. Having cirrhosis means you're at risk for variceal bleeding. Most people actually don't get that. The next stage of cirrhosis is when your liver function is impaired. And I told you your liver makes your proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. If you cannot make proteins anymore, your muscles start to disappear. So I ask people, look, send, show me a picture of yourself two years ago, a year ago. Is there any difference? And usually you can actually tell their faces become skinnier, their arms are scrawnier, things start to sag. You can see their ribs very easily. Okay? And that is actually is a sign of, it almost looks like malnutrition, but it's a sign of liver failure. When your protein levels are very, very low, you tend to retain water. So some people get swollen ankles, but most people actually get retention of water inside their abdominal cavity, something we call ascites. It's almost like being pregnant. You could have 5, 10, 15 liters of fluid inside. It becomes very uncomfortable. The very last thing about liver function is I told you things have to go in. Your liver has to know how to get rid of stuff as well. So with end-stage liver failure from cirrhosis, you can't get rid of wastes. And so things start to build up. And the most important thing is this pigment called bilirubin. It makes people turn yellow. So jaundice is the very last stage of cirrhosis. Okay. So what does it mean to have cirrhosis? It means you're at risk for all of these things, risk of variceal bleeding, risk of liver failure. And the last thing, of course, is liver cancer um, that cirrhosis raises the risk of. Okay. So liver function tests are function tests not liver enzymes. So most doctors would say, I can check your liver function test, but these tests have nothing to do with liver function, have nothing to do with cirrhosis, and specifically for alpha-1 are generally not helpful for the diagnosis of liver disease from alpha-1. All right. Um, I actually just told you all about that. This is what cirrhosis means. Okay. So this is a cartoon I use for doctors to sort of ex to illustrate the problem of a chronic liver disease and where do we want to find disease, where do we want to intervene. So for those old enough to know about Mad Magazine, that's Alfred E. Newman and his motto is, what me worry, which means if it ain't broke, don't fix it, don't look for it, right? But conceptually, just like with the lung, there's ex you have extra uh, capacity. You don't need 100% of your liver to feel completely normal. So if you're going from the left to the right, let's say how much of your liver is being lost compared to on the, on the up and down, how much liver function you have. The concept is that even if you lost half your liver, if I went into any one of you and chopped out half your liver, what would your liver function be? It would be normal. It would be over 90%. Forget your 80% FEV1. We're talking over 90% if I chop out half your liver. Okay? And we kind of know this because for liver transplantation, one of the big ways of getting a new liver is if someone donates part of the liver. They actually donate two thirds of their liver to you. Okay? The entire right lobe. And they're fine. So within eight weeks, the entire liver grows back. But more importantly, right after the operation, their liver functions normal. Okay? You need to lose more than two-thirds of your liver. The problem is, once you hit that magical, actually it's more than two-thirds, about three-quarters. Once you've lost three-quarters of your liver and you lose a little bit more, it's like falling off a cliff. Your liver function falls really, really quickly. Okay? So what you guys have been calling cirrhosis to, uh, to me is liver failure. And liver failure means that you've lost more than 80% of your liver. Okay, you've missed the boat in terms of trying to find liver disease. 
you're at end stage uh, disease, which is why it's not surprising that um, when, when you find liver failure, the survival is so short. So um, we now have clinical stages of cirrhosis. So once someone has cirrhosis, they've lost more than 50%, people tend to get complications in steps. So the first thing is they get soft gel varices that may or may not bleed, and then the next step is they get liver failure. And, but at any of these steps, you can get liver cancer. So this is useful for doctors. If you ever make a diagnosis of cirrhosis, and you're supposed to think someone has cirrhosis because their platelet count is just a little bit too low. So normal is over 150. So anyone with a platelet count of 150, I say think that they have cirrhosis and you'd be two thirds correct. Okay, if they have cirrhosis, you want to look for veins before they bleed, so people generally get gastroscopies. You want to look for evidence of liver failure, so yes, you can look for fluid retention, but you can actually check protein levels, check clotting factors, and that will tell you if someone's already in liver failure. You want to look for liver cancer, because liver cancer, believe it or not, is one of those cancers that's not the kiss of death if you find it small. It's actually one of the very curable cancers uh, if you catch it in time. Okay, so can we do better? I already told you by looking at the platelet count, the test is called a CBC, which is a complete blood count, and anyone with a platelet count of under 150 thinks cirrhosis. The guidelines say to do an ultrasound. An ultrasound is a terrible test for cirrhosis. It's a great test for liver failure, absolutely terrible test for cirrhosis, okay? The only reason why you would do an ultrasound is actually if you're looking for cancer, not if you're looking for cirrhosis. Liver biopsy, this is actually a pretty accurate, it's, it's on, you can Google it, it's on the internet, but this is actually an accurate picture of how a liver biopsy is done. So remember, liver is underneath your ribs on the right side, and you actually stick a needle in between the ribs. It looks a little bit bloody, but it's not that bad. Um, it's a pretty safe test, so I do, I'm still one of the remnants on the, uh, that still does liver biopsies myself. What we do is we, uh, we tend to give people medications to reduce their anxiety, so sort of a cousin of Valium that we inject, so they're a bit loopy. And then we give them a local freezing, and I've actually done a biopsy on a, on a dentist, and he says this hurts less than freezing the teeth, so he should know. And then you just stick this needle in and out really fast, like under a second, and you're pretty much done. It gives you a tiny piece of liver so that you can look at what the liver looks like. And for those who like visual things, it's actually a very satisfying thing because it gives you something like this. Under the microscope, the top left is what a normal liver looks like. There are blood vessels, and in between, there's all these liver cells trying to do its job. But you can look at things like on the top right, that was some, that's a hepatitis, so hepatitis C, hepatitis B. All those blue things are your immune system trying to fight the virus. Bottom left is fatty liver. So diabetes and being overweight are the commonest causes of fatty liver, as is alcohol, and that can certainly damage the liver. And bottom right, you see all those big bands of scar. That's actually cirrhosis. So this person with this degree of cirrhosis would have a normal ultrasound, and you wouldn't know it, no symptoms. So a biopsy is really good because you can visually see what's going on, how bad is the cirrhosis. But when I showed that sign, you guys all went, ugh, biopsy needle. So people don't like biopsies, okay? So we have to move to a field of liver disease where things have progressed, and that field is hepatitis C. Why hepatitis C? Because it's pretty common, much more common than alpha-1, and there's been a lot of money spent on hepatitis C. So what they did was, believe it or not, back in 1989 when hepatitis C was first discovered, most liver specialists did not believe that hepatitis C caused liver disease. So they had to prove it. And so what the French did, this guy named Poignard, brilliant man, he took all these French guys with hepatitis C, tried to figure out how long they've had hepatitis C, like when did you have your blood transfusion, when did you first use drugs, for example. And then they said, okay, you had it for 10 years, you had it for 20 years, you had it for 50 years. And he biopsied everybody. And he came to the conclusion that hepatitis C caused disease because the longer they had hepatitis C, the more scarring they had. That was conclusion number one. Conclusion number two was that a liver biopsy is a bad test because sometimes when you do a biopsy, you don't get enough liver. And when you don't get enough liver, you can't say very much. You're just guessing. Number three is patients hated biopsies. So those are three main conclusions. So 
being very smart, he says, we have hundreds of biopsies. Why don't we do every conceivable blood test there is that might be associated with scarring or inflammation and put it all together and see if we can actually predict the, bi the biopsy. And lo and behold, he could. He took five blood tests together with whether you're a man or a woman and how old you are, put it into a magic formula, which he called the fibro test, and then it was pretty good, 90% of the time, what you saw in the biopsy is what you saw in the blood test. So by the mid-2000s, liver biopsy disappeared from Europe, but it still persisted in North America. And the reason was because he was not just very, very smart. Well, he was very smart, but a little bit greedy. What he said was, hey, patients with hep C, if you do these blood tests, come to my website, give me your credit card, I will charge you 50 euros, and you will get your answer. So biopsies disappeared. And of course, the Americans said, forget it, because the Americans came from Puritans, and they said, no, there's no money involved. So the Americans refused to adopt it. But it's actually a very good test for hepatitis C. Okay? And they attacked it, the Americans attacked it so much that the French had to do a ton of studies uh, to validate it, and it actually is valid. But um, I don't show it. But what's great about all the validation studies is that one of his students, who's now very famous on his own right, in the validation studies, um, he put the secret formula in the methods of the paper. So once he did that, we no longer had to go to his website to pay him 50 euros. We could just put the formula in. And so we actually have the formula. If you look at Wikipedia, they have the formula as well. Okay, so down the street from where Thierry Poignard was working, another group of hepatologists, who by the way, that's all French, and the French love their wine and cheese, they were out at a wine and cheese thing, and they were talking to the cheesemakers. And the cheesemakers, they said, how do you do your quality control? So for cheese, you can do a biopsy. You can get a small core, and you can taste it, and you can say, oh, this cheese is coming along very well. But it actually doesn't tell you about its texture. To get its texture, you have to do a big cut, right? So it's just like a liver and a liver biopsy. So the cheese people, being very smart in their own right, what they did was they knocked on the, liver, on the cheese, right? You can tell. Not as hard, harder. So the cheesemakers came up with this ultrasound device that knocked on the cheese, and based on what it, how hard it was, it travels through the cheese differently, or another way of saying it is it sounds different. It sounds harder or softer. And the liver people said, oh my god, the liver is exactly like cheese, because when you get scarring in your liver, it gets harder. So they invented this machine that was adapted from the cheesemakers called a fibroscan. So in between your liver, you can knock on your liver, uh, 10 times. It's, very, it's not a very hard knock, it's a soft knock, and uh, it'll tell you how hard your liver is. It takes a minute, one minute, and that's it, okay? And uh, it gives you a picture like this, so the, on the top right you can see this dark line, that's the knock going through the liver, and if there's more scarring it goes through the liver faster and faster, so it'll become more like a vertical line, so on the horizontal is how long it takes. So in one minute I can tell someone if they have cirrhosis or not. Okay, even with a normal ultrasound, normal, it's probably the best test we have for cirrhosis right now. Now the problem is, how, have you guys been to Paris, France? Short and skinny, they're all short and skinny, <laughs> right? So when I tell you how to do it, you know, and you know if I see a Frenchman, you would knock this much, but for a North American, you gotta, you gotta bang. Okay, so this test, it turned out, did not work for North Americans because it wasn't knocking hard enough and it wasn't looking deep enough. So they've actually since then created a probe for North Americans, so they call the, the French probe an M probe for medium and the North Americans is XL. <laughs> okay, but they also have an S for kids for small. Okay, so what can we do about alpha-1 in the liver? Now, we, I'm, I've just told you that I believe your guidelines are not good for detecting liver disease. There are better tools for looking at liver disease, and personally, I think that anyone with alpha-1 should have a fiber scan done. Okay, so I've said it, and I've just countered your guidelines. So what if you find liver disease? Because all my students will tell me, so what, you can't do anything about it. Okay, so this paper came out of Toronto in 2000. It's been the guiding light of liver disease. Because until this paper, you would say that once you have cirrhosis, there's nothing you can do about it. It's a one-way street to death. And what happened was, this is a patient of a colleague of mine, Morris Sherman, 
for those who may know. He had a patient with hepatitis B, and that was the liver biopsy, okay? So on the, on the top one, that squiggly sort of, after you stick a needle in, that came out. It's ugly, it's not straight, it's got all that blue stuff, which is scar, and that's a blow up of it on the left, which has got tons of scar everywhere. And back in the 90s, there was a new drug called lamivudine. It was created for HIV, but also worked for hepatitis B. So by study protocol, they did the biopsy before they gave him the drug, they did the biopsy one year after they gave him the drug, and that's what it looked like on the bottom. All the blue is gone. Okay, and they said, oh my God, this guy's 40 years old, he's had hepatitis B for 40 years, in one year we have made his liver 40 years younger. Okay, actually it's not true. The liver is still abnormal, the scar is gone, but what we do know is that liver failure goes away. These people that used to die all the time in the late 1990s, now no longer die. They no longer need a transplant because the drugs are so good. Okay? We now know it's true for hepatitis C because the drugs for hepatitis C are now so good. We know it's true for alcoholic liver disease if people can stop drinking. We know it's true for genetic diseases of accumulating, accumulation. So hemochromatosis is people who accumulate iron. Wilson's disease is people who accumulate copper. All genetic, all takes a long time, but if you can stop the accumulation and get the levels of iron and copper down, the cirrhosis, the fibrosis goes away and they lead a normal life. We do not know that for alpha-1 because there's been no treatment for alpha-1 liver disease. Okay, but it's the next big thing to tackle. So, Let's compare viral hepatitis, the one, the case I showed you, which was our first success from hepatitis B, and alpha-1. What exactly do we see? So unlike lung disease, alpha-1 is a storage disease. There's too much alpha-1 in the liver, okay? And the same thing is true for hepatitis B. So on the left is hepatitis B, on the right is alpha-1. The deep, on the right-hand side, the deep bur purple, so that's your alpha-1. You know your augmentation therapy? That's the stuff they want to augment you with. But it's all stuck in the liver. Okay, if you get it out of the liver, then it would work, okay? But on the left, hepatitis B, you can also see some what we call ground glass cells. That's hepatitis, tons of hepatitis B. But the difference is on the lower panels. So in alpha-1, you can see those dark purple globules. It's just sitting there in liver cells, whereas on the left, with hepatitis B, your immune system knows the virus shouldn't be there, and it starts to attack it. And actually, most of the disease from hepatitis B is from your immune system. So if we turn off the virus, the immune system stops attacking it, people live. The question is, if I get rid of those purple things, can I make liver disease any better? And that we don't know because until now, we've never been able to do this. So conceptually, on the top, liver makes almost everything for you, including alpha-1, okay? So the alpha-1 is, uh, is made in the liver, secreted to the heart, heart pumps it out to the lungs, and there it protects your lungs. That's in what you want to see. The problem with liver disease is that in certain forms of liver disease, so we were talking specifically about ZZ, and in some cases of SZ, the protein is just a little bit bent, a little bit misshapen. Okay? And it's misshapen in a way where it's almost like the, they're all the same, but they're, it's the best way, uh, what's a good way? Plates, plates or bowls, they stack up together. And when they stack up together, you get this big long chain, chain of plates and bowls that are stuck in the liver, and that is probably what causes liver disease. Okay? It's too much. So people looked at this in agonizing detail, and over the year, the picture that's evolving is that the ZZ, for example, prevents the shape of the protein from folding into the right shape to be secreted out into the blood to go to your liver, to your lungs, to help your lungs, okay? But instead, what it does is it sort of interacts with each other, and it forms these big, long chains. And if you look at the right, this is actually a photograph from an electron microscope, so if you take your liver cell and you blow it up 100,000 times, you can actually see those sort of little beads on a string. Those are all alpha ones that are stacked on top of each other, and they're stuck inside the liver, okay? Now, what's also become clear is that this is not what happens to all of it, because some of it does leak out. Some of it does get secreted. Some of it does protect the lungs, because not everyone with ZZ, for example, has lung disease. 
so there's, there's enough of it gets out. And also, not everyone with ZZ has liver disease. So the liver has ways of protecting itself. It can actually get rid of the alpha-1 and not let it accumulate. How does it do that? Well, the first thing they looked at was that the, the liver has defenses. So there's something called, it's something that's so common, it's ubiquitous. And so it was so ubiquitous, they called it ubiquitin. So there's a protein called ubiquitin that says, you know what, this is too much. We don't need this. This is garbage. So you tag it with, with ubiquitin, and that tells your cells that this is garbage. Go dispo dispose of it. So it sends it to something called a proteasome, which chops it up, and you recycle the proteins, and you go and make more proper alpha-1. So people have looked at that and asked, can we use that system to tag more retained alpha-1 and get rid of it? And the answer is, we don't know anything yet. Okay? But another way of doing it is another way of recycling stuff comes from uh, initially studies of, I think, starvation. So it turns out that if you're starving because you don't have enough food, your body tries to recycle itself. It eats itself. So the term is called autophagy. Auto means self. Phagy means to eat. So what it does on the bottom right is that you throw these membranes, you, you, almost like you encircle whatever you want to eat inside a bubble, and you throw digestive enzymes at it, and then you digest it, and you take the nutrients from that, and you recycle it. So if you're starving, it's good nutrients, but if you have alpha-1 retained in the liver, you can get rid of alpha-1 in that manner. So that's where people have gone, and um, this is a slide in mice as a proof of concept. So on the top left, you see in the top, the first one, top part of it has lots of alpha-1, lots of dark purple, and the bottom one has less dark purple. What's the difference? They gave these mice a drug that induced that autophagy. Okay? So it's saying to the mice, recycle yourself more. If you see more retained proteins, eat it. And in the liver, it seems to have worked. And this is just to prove that there was alpha-1. So the dark top right is the, sorry, the bottom, bottom left is using a special stain looking for alpha-1 specifically. And you can see in the top two, there's a lot of alpha-1. And the bottom two, there's not a lot of alpha-1. So this drug seemed to work. And this drug, believe it or not, is something called carbamazepine, which is uh, something you use for seizures. Okay? And when they looked for these vesicles, remember I told you, you just want to surround it with a membrane that uh, tries to eat it. They can actually see the membrane, which is the top right, which is the purple. And more importantly, in the mice, top two, all the red, that's scarring in the liver, whereas on the bottom panel, the scar is gone. So the proof of concept, you can decrease alpha-1 and decrease scars, scarring in the liver. Okay? So... Um, this is being tested in humans. The study's been going on for several years. They've had a terribly tough time finding patients. And what they want, actually, are adults, well, 14 to 80. They have to be ZZ or SZ, and you must have cirrhosis. And the rationale here is that if you want to see scarring go away, you have to have scarring. Right? So they're taking people with the extreme scarring. They are taking people with liver cirrhosis and liver failure and they're giving them these drugs. And you have to have liver failure within some reason because this drug treatment's for a year. So you have to be, we expect you to live for more than a year is the criteria if you have cirrhosis. So you have to have cirrhosis and liver failure as long as the liver failure doesn't mean you're going to die next month. Okay? And so that's exactly what I did to my patient. He's now actually going to Pittsburgh next week. Next week. The Ameri it's funded by the American government, the NIH. They fly him down for free, and they take care of everything. Okay, so this is someone, that guy I told you about in the beginning, that they said there's no specific therapy. They're doing this to him. Not only that, but even if there's no specific therapy, the treatment for liver failure is actually liver transplant. So he's, he's seen our liver transplant team, and our liver transplant team has agreed to transplant him if this doesn't work. So. Hope was not all lost. It was worth referring him to see us. Okay, so can we do something about this before it gets so desperate? So this is the one that Dr. Chapman was telling us about earlier, that there's new ways of tackling this. So this is brand new technology. This is space age. It's called silencing RNA, but it's effectively targeted molecular scissors. So what do I mean by that? For this, you need to understand some biology. Um, 
you know that your DNA is your genetic code. How does it work? So your DNA is a set of instructions, right? It says, make this. And the DNA is precious. You can't make mistakes in your DNA. So your DNA doesn't do the work directly. It makes a copy itself called RNA or messenger RNA. Okay, so it sends the RNA out into the cell, and the RNA says, I have the instructions. Follow these instructions, and we will make the protein. And the problem with ZZ or SZ is that the original DNA has a mistake in it that's making Z instead of M. Okay, so if you don't want Z or S to be made, what you want to do is go into the cell, in the liver specifically, and snip out those instructions. Okay, so the other thing that people realized is that our genetic code is DNA. The message is R, something called RNA. It's like DNA, but slightly different. So we always have two strands of DNA, and we, when we make this copy or directions, we have a DNA next to an RNA. We absolutely never have two RNAs together. Okay, viruses have that, but humans never do. And we are programmed to, to know that if you ever see two RNAs together, it's a virus, go and destroy it, okay? So what these people have done is they have made an RNA that looks like the Z, but it's a mirror image such that it will bind to the RNA completely, all right? And when you bind to the RNA, you suddenly have two RNAs and your cell will destroy it. It's Specific, like you've heard about paternity tests, that, you know, your, your DNA of a se certain sequence is exactly has to be in that family, or you know, did you kill someone, is it your blood? It's DNA matching, so it's that specific. And they can very specifically target the Z allele in this, uh, in this study. So it's very exciting times. You can t theoretically tackle any disease where you can get this RNA into the cell. It just turns out that the liver is one of those places where you can get this stuff in very specifically because the liver takes everything up from your gut. There's lots of, of receptors that tell your liver, take me up, I'm a good, uh, I'm a good raw material. So what they did was they, they, conjug they put this together with something that was a good thing that the liver was supposed to take up. So all the liver cells take it up and you can get this into the liver and make your liver stop making Z. Okay, so again in mice, as a proof in concept, uh, they're looking at different days after the infusions and you can see the alpha one, which is the purple stuff, just going away, all right? Whether this translates to humans, I've shown you for both these studies, we've, we know that it works in mice, we know that we can t knock down the, the Z in your liver, and we know that that makes the scarring go away. Whether that works in humans, we don't know, that's what the current studies are to do. Okay, and so this is the study. I, in the bottom on the blue, I didn't tell you this, Dr. Chapman mentioned the site called clinicaltrials.gov. They're all listed as studies that are uh, recruiting patients. So they're looking for people who are adults between 18 and 75. They're not looking for SZ because this is specific for Z. So only for people with ZZ. Uh, they're excluding smokers for the last three years because theoretically you can actually drive down the blood levels of uh, of alpha-1, that so you're less protected for your lungs, can't have regular use of alcohol in the last month, and you can't have any other liver, liver diseases that are causing scarring in the liver because they want to see if this actually helps with the scarring in the liver when you knock down the ZZ. Okay, so it's exciting times. We've gone from, I've told you about how people misdiagnose cirrhosis versus liver failure. I've told you how people think they can look for cirrhosis in a certain way which is completely useless, but I've told you that there are now new tests looking for cirrhosis. The cheapest and easiest is a CBC or platelet count. Uh, a fibro test is certainly available for most people. A fibro scan in certain centers have fibro scans. Um, I've told you that people are now moving away from the concept that there's no treatment for liver disease. So if everything else fails, yes, you can get a transplant. If there's cancer, I didn't mention cancer very much, but cancer treatment is extremely successful. Long-term survivals, if you have a small cancer, which is why if you have cirrhosis, it's worth doing that ultrasound every six months to look for cancer. I've told you that there's new strategies for getting Z out of your liver, and from, if you believe that mice are like men, then there's hope that the scarring can get better. There's still a lot of questions that I 
came up with as I was re reviewing all this stuff, and some of them are actually pretty big because I always thought, you know, there are people that retain in the liver and get liver disease and people that don't. So I have been biopsying people, young people, and saying, you know what, you have no alpha-1 in your liver right now, you're not going to accumulate, you're probably fine. But just because they don't retain at age 20 doesn't mean they won't retain at age 40. That's actually never been shown. We actually don't know why some people retain and why some people don't, and whether it's something that they did or something in their environment that triggers re the retention, nobody actually knows because nobody's been doing liver biopsies on these on, like you guys. What makes it accumulate? What can skew it towards accumulation versus skewing it to releasing into the blood, which is what you actually want, versus making it, like instead of retaining your cell getting rid of it, we actually have no idea. But there's new therapies to try and skew it towards one way or the other. So my bottom line recommendation is that everyone with alpha-1 should have at least a one-time assessment for liver disease, that people remember that a low platelet count of under 150 should trigger more intensive search for cirrhosis. And if your doctor doesn't have fiber test or fiber scan, they should do a liver biopsy. Fiber tests and fiber scans, even though it's very good for hepatitis C, actually have never been validated for alpha-1. Although it's hard to imagine that if you don't have a hard, if you have a hard liver on a fiber scan, it's, it's got to be cirrhosis, not anything else. A liver biopsy that's normal at age 20, I always used to think was reassuring. Now I'm actually saying, I realize that there's actually no data, no literature that says that just because your liver biopsy was normal at age 20 that you can't be abnormal at age 60. If you have cirrhosis, you sh definitely should have an ultrasound every six months looking for cancer. And the reason why is because cancer is so easily treatable if you find it small. If there is liver failure, then don't forget liver transplantation, okay? The liver transplanters are now looking for more work because their number one cause for transplants in Canada is disappearing, which is hepatitis C. We now cure hep C, and liver transplant for hep C, will, I'm guessing, will disappear by 2020. So we hear about long wait lists for transplants that may not be true in the future. And certainly, if you have liver failure, you should be considered for um, transplant. And carbamazepine, the study is going to close in early 2017, and hopefully we'll see that it has some good data supporting its use in people with alpha-1 liver disease. And that's all I have. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Dr. Wong? I have one. Um, you're saying that um, liver um, transplant may go out because hep C is going, but what about cancer? Would you, are there liver transplants for cancer? Sure. So there's actually many different treatments for a liver cancer, and we go through a stepwise algorithm, everything stepwise. But the intent for treating liver cancer is always to try and cure it. So liver transplants does cure liver cancer, as long as the cancer has not spread. The problem is that it's a very drastic treatment for cancer, when there are other treatments that may work. So there is something amazing called radiofrequency ablation, or RFA. And so if your cancer is small, under an inch, two and a half centimeters, three centimeters, what they can do is, on an ultrasound, see the cancer, it's like a little ball. They stick a needle into the cancer, and the tip is in the middle of that cancer. They flick a switch. And the best way of explaining it is that it's like a localized microwave. So you're left with a hole in your liver after about two and a half, three minutes. They pull it out. They watch you for two hours to make sure you're okay, and you go home. And the cure rate's about 80% which is amazing for cancer, okay? But it's only if it's small. That's why you need to do the ultrasounds every six months. If you don't do the ultrasounds and I see a cancer that's, you know, 12 centimeters, no one can cure that. So there would be no transplant? Sorry? There would be no transplant either. Well, once it gets beyond a certain size, that when it's small, it doesn't, cancers don't spread. But the bigger they get, the more likely it is that they've spread. So if it's already spread to the, to the lungs, for example, taking out your liver is not going to help. You still have cancer in the lungs, okay? So transplant is useful if none of the other options for cure can cure you, then people will start thinking about transplants. Okay. 
Okay? So for cancer, we always ask, can we cure it, yes or no? And if we cannot, can we slow it down? And there's lots of new things. There's chemotherapy, there's radiation, and there's surprising things. Radiation we never used to be able to give before because it was too toxic for the liver. Now, with computerized technology, they, can, they are able to give radiation almost right to the cancer but nowhere else, and we're seeing some pretty interesting results. People are living when we didn't think they would live. Anyone else have a question? Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Wang.